So what we're doing today is Bernoulli's principle. And Bernoulli's principle, our final topic in fluids, involves applying energy conservation to a fluid and seeing what, if anything, comes out that's interesting. Turns out that it's a phenomenon that's very common, uh, or a way of looking at things. It's, uh, you've probably experienced Bernoulli's principle about four times today already. Okay? So let's talk about it. We're going to apply energy conservation to a fluid. So there's our master energy equation. And let me remind you what's involved. E is what we call mechanical energy. We have two types. The energy you can see and the energy that you can't. Kinetic energy of motion, potential energy stored up. And at this point, we've introduced two types of each. And in fact, in your homework 10, there's a pinball machine problem where you have to wrangle all four of those. Okay, you have a spring that can store energy. You have a pinball that's going up in height, so you have gravitational potential energy involved. It's rolling, which means that it has both center of mass motion, translational kinetic energy, and it's rolling, so it has rotational kinetic energy too. So, let's go ahead and apply it to a fluid. So I have a narrowing pipe. I talked about that last time. We looked at this for flow rate. One of the things we said was that if you narrow the cross-sectional area, the fluid goes faster. That's just a what goes in must come out type of situation. So we have that if we go from section one to section two, if we have a given chunk of fluid that's traveling at speed V1, it'll sub travel substantially faster when it goes into the narrower, narrower section. The finger on the end of the garden hose example uh, is one of these. So let's try to take a look at this with energy. Well, first of all, no spring in sight, so let's drop the spring term. We're not going to bounce our water off springs. Um, we're also not going to let our water rotate. We're just going to have our water move in uh, linear paths, so forget that term. Um, so we just have really translational kinetic energy to worry about and potential energy of gravity. Although in this case, um, while I may have a pipe that maybe you know, goes vertically, delivers water up to the third floor or whatever, um, in this case my pipe is horizontal and yet my, my fluid is speeding up anyway. So it's not getting its kinetic energy, so the kinetic energy is clearly increasing. <coughs> Right? It's not getting that because it's falling down. Where is it getting that from? Why, how is that water going faster? What's giving it more energy? Pressure. That's right. The water around it. So there is this water chunk of water is not the only chunk of water around. It's got a bunch of water behind it and some water ahead of it, of course, too. So it is the fact that it is under pressure from other water. So where is the only place we could account for that? It's not, if it's nowhere here, where is it? Non-conservative work. Okay. So we often had applied forces uh, in there, right? So if you're, say, lifting a crate or something like that, right? You're the non-conservative work that's giving the crate more mechanical energy, right? There's some familiar homework problems. Remember that? So in this case, what's doing the pushing is not a human being, it's the surrounding water. So let's go ahead and throw this in. Um, let's work out what the non-conservative work term is. Remember these, we have to compute the old-fashioned way. So it's force delta x cosine of theta. So this is going all the way back to the first day of the work energy unit. We still have to compute non-conservative works this old-fashioned way. So let's figure it out. Well, there's generally speaking, there's a pressure P1 in this section of 2. Now, at first, when this chunk of water is entirely in section 1, it's got P1 on one side and P1 on the other side, too. And so that's why its speed won't change. Likewise, over here, once it gets into section 2, it's going to travel at a speed v2, and the reason why is that the pressure on both sides is the same. Where the speeding up occurs is when it crosses this thresh threshold, right? 
When that chunk of water crosses that threshold, it'll have pressure P1 behind, but a pressure P2 ahead. So let's let maybe show it transitioning from one region to the other. Like that. So that's a chunk of water on its way from one section of pipe into another. Let's talk about what happens with it in terms of forces, the force method. When the force method, its velocity is this way, and it's speeding up. So which is to be the direction of the acceleration? With it. With it. And what's the direction of the force? Oh, I already gave it away from Tom, sorry. And that force and acceleration are always together, right? Okay, so that net force, of course, comes from the pressure difference, right? The fact that there's a different pressure. Now the area, I guess I can draw it 3D here, the area of, over which it's pushing on both ahead and behind is the same. So the area is not different. So the pressures have to be different. Which pressure is bigger? The pressure P1 or P2? P1. P1, right? P1 has to win. There has to be a larger pressure behind and a smaller pressure ahead. Because remember, we learned that the force always points towards the lower pressure, right? If you have two pressures, the big one wins and the smaller one has to take it, right? So remember that our force always points towards lower pressure. That's the op main thing I said that we're going to factor in in some way in everything we do in the fluids unit. We use that to calculate the hydrostatic pressure formula. It's the what behind buoyancy. Why is it that an object feels an upward force from a fluid? It's because the pressure below it on the bottom part of the object is higher than the pressure on top. So the force pushes up, because that's from lower pressure, uh, higher pressure to lower pressure, right? So here we see it again. There's a force from higher pressure to lower pressure. Okay? So um, let's like, take a look at it in the energy method. How can we explain it? And the energy method, we say that the kinetic energy increases. So what's our sign convention for work? Is that positive or negative work? Positive. Positive, right? Positive makes a contribution, right? So our non-conservative work is expected to be positive here. Remember, that makes a deposit to the kinetic energy. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, knock it out here. Um, the force due to the pressure difference, uh, well, this is just a magnitude. So I want to make sure to subtract in a way that I don't get a negative by accident. So P1 is the bigger one. P1 minus P2 times A. That is the uh, force from the pressure difference. So we did that, I think, last week. We have two competing forces from the pressures, but they can't both win, right? The pressure, the pressure P1 behind says, hey, get a move on. We want to get there too. And the pressure ahead says, hey, quit crowding me. But there can only be one winner, right? So P1 wins, P2 loses. The chunk actually moves toward lower pressure. Um, what else? We have delta X. Delta X is the uh, amount over which this acts. Now, let me point out that the displacement zone, well remember, that's only going to act while this thing is crossing over the threshold, right? It's only going to act when uh, there's different pressures on the two sides. And that's only when the width of the chunk moves across the zone from one pipe to the other. And then, uh, finally, what is the angle between the force and displacement? Zero, right? The displacement's the same way. So they're both to the right, so that's zero. Cosine of zero is plus one. And of course, that's a good thing because we said the work should be plus, right? Another thing that might be interesting to shorthand this, what is A times delta X? That's the volume of that chunk, isn't it, right? A is the cross-sectional area, and the displacement over which this has to chance to act is just a chunk of water. So here's our formula for the non-conservative work on this water chunk as done by its surroundings.
So with that in mind, let's go ahead and do the rest of the energy equation. Obviously, this is the new part that uh, we haven't seen before, but everything else is just the same. Um, let me go ahead and put in my terms, my good old kinetic energy, and I'm also going to put in this, just in case maybe I want this pipe to be able to be vertical or, or angled, right? So I'm going to go ahead and put in. Here is the mechanical energy in section one. Has kinetic energy, maybe some potential energy. I have my non-conservative work from the surrounding water. And then, of course, I may have different values for the kinetic energy and or potential energy in the second section. This is basically the idea of Bernoulli's principle, but I'm going to rearrange it in such a way that we see a very handy way of doing things. A couple problems within its current form. This cherry picks one chunk of water to look at, which is silly because we don't care about one chunk of water more than the others. That's just a tool for getting somewhere where we can say something about the entire water. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to divide out the volume, volume of my chunk for the specific purpose of getting rid of this V, right? Because I don't want to talk about the volume of just one little bit of it. Now you might say, doesn't that just slosh my problem somewhere else? Well, here's the beauty of it. It gets rid of all my problems simultaneously. Because also over here, I have masses of my arbitrary chunk. That's an arbitrary mass of a particular chunk of water. But mass divided by volume, that's not arbitrary. What's mass of volume? Density. density. So density of a fluid is something you can say, whether there is a lot of it or a little bit, it's just the property of the thing itself. So just in one fell swoop, I'm now not talking about one particular bit of the water. I'm saying things that are generally true for the water. So let's see what I get. So now, there is no mention whatsoever of any particular bit of water. Everything in here now is something you can generically say, right? I have the density of the fluid. I have what is the general speed of the fluid in section one? What is the speed of it in section two? What is the height of it in section one? What's the height of it in section two? What are the pressures in each side, right? So this is a much easier workable thing. One more thing and we're done. Let me point out, this is the speed in section one, right? This is the height in section one. This is the pressure in section one. Here's the speed in section two, height in section two. And over here, not on the side with his friends, is the pressure. So let me take that, P2, and put it over here. Just so I have all the one stuff on the left-hand side and all the two stuff on the right. Anyone notice anything about those two sides now? They're the same. We've found some weird, bizarre, conserved quantity for a fluid. So this is Bernoulli's principle, is that there is a quantity which is actually conserved for a, a fluid. So let me write that down. Are there any questions up here before I clear a little space? Okay, so here's Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle is that this quantity, I'll put pressure in the front, pressure plus this stuff is conserved for an ideal fluid. So if you have a fluid, you can count on those three things added together. If you can find out what they are in one place, it's going to be true everywhere in that fluid. You can trade individual pieces of that, but you can't change the sum of these three as a whole. 
Now, you notice I snuck in the word ideal fluid. There are a couple things that are required for this to be true. First of all, we totally neglected rotational kinetic energy. You may know that there's something called turbulence, right? Where the water is kind of whirlpooling around. Can't have that, okay? So we have that there's no turbulence. Also, there cannot be any friction with the walls of the container. So big ifs, <coughs> but still suitable enough for our purposes. So we should probably should not have um, you know, pipes filled with honey or molasses, okay? Things that are very sticky. Maybe for water this will be fairly reasonable. So that's Bernoulli's principle, is that this quantity is conserved. And I'll give names for these. Now this, this was kinetic energy until, uh, translational kinetic energy until I divided by V, right? It's right here. This divided by V. It was Ke per V. I like to call it kinetic energy density. It's the kinetic energy contained per unit volume of the fluid. Okay? So, kinetic energy density. Kinetic energy density. It's literally measured in joules per cubic meter. It's how much kinetic energy is contained per cubic meter of the fluid. Same thing with this. This was good old MGH until I divided it by V. What this is, is the gravitational potential energy per unit volume. I like to call it the potential energy density of the fluid. It's how much potential energy is contained per unit volume of your fluid, which is, of course, a continuous thing. So you can't say, I have a total amount of water this. What you say is, I have a, the water I have is this, and it has this much potential energy per unit volume, no matter how much of it or how little of it I have flowing. And then this one, which seems bizarre, like it really shouldn't even be on the list. Pressure. Right? Pressure is force per area. Right? What is it doing added to kinetic energy density? It seems like it's almost like one of those things where you're trying to add a meter to a second, right? They're not even seem like they're like things. These are kinetic energy densities. This is a pressure. Remember, a pressure is newtons per meter squared. Well, if you work out the units, force per area has exactly the same units as energy per volume. If you don't believe me, remember that a joule is a newton meter. So the meter cancel with the meters, and you have newtons per meter squared. So it is appropriate, even though this seems like the most random collection of things, the sum of these is conserved. And since for us, the density of the fluid is constant, remember we deal with, if we're going to deal with this, we're going to deal with liquids. We want to deal with incompressible fluids. Their density doesn't change. There's really only three things in this formula that can change, P, V, and H. Those are the three active ingredients. The pressure of a fluid, the speed, and the height. So what's the pressure of the fluid? How fast is it going? And how high is it above the ground? And what this equation tells us is that all three of those can't increase at once, because that would be violating the conservation. All three can't decrease at once. If one of them stays constant and one of them increases, the third has to decrease, things like that. That's the whole idea of conservation, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now show you all of the things that come out of this, first conceptually, and then um, I'll do a quantitative calculation as well. So hopefully kind of give you the grand tour of this principle. Are there any questions before I? Yeah. Uh, for the height, <coughs> is it from the ground to the bottom of each part? Or how do you calculate the height? Um, so remember, this is good old MGH that this came from. So it's exactly like that. So you set some H equals 0 at the lowest head of interest. And then everything above that is has some, the higher you get above that, the higher it is. Okay. Um, in this case, I probably would set 
h equals zero here, and now you have to worry about it. But if our pipe takes a turn and goes up, then it would gain some height from there. What if that was like two meters above the ground? Well, remember, you usually set the h equals zero the lowest head of interest. You do that in lots of problems. I think you did it. Uh, you did like a skateboard ramp problem where it like started here and flew up here. Remember that problem? Don't set h equals zero at the ground. Set it here because that's the lowest height you care about. Okay. Right. So um, just set it for convenience, like you did before. Okay. Um, any other questions before I? Yeah. Somebody once told me that if you have a type of water or something into it and you have it um, going vertically, it doesn't matter how many loop de loops or whatever there are. It, the pressure at the bottom will be the same. Uh, so if you have that the uh, H is changing, uh, but the, um, at, at, so the H is changing, and there's, you are, because you're at the vertical, right? And you're saying P is the same? Uh, if you have uh, just a straight pipe and a pipe that, that does all kind of wacky turns at the bottom, um, I think you're talking about when the, they're stationary, right? Is that when it's what? a stationary pipe, or like like the water's not moving? Oh, I, I don't know. I just uh, well, I mean, it's certainly possible, right? Here, if you if you change h, right? If you change v instead of p, you can keep p constant, right? If, as long as you're trading h with v, mm -hmm. right? So the point is that when you have three things that are all interrelating to each other, then um, you can't hold one constant while you change the other two. So that's exactly where I'm, where I'm going with this. I'm going to actually take a turn holding each one constant while I vary the other two against each other. So maybe that'll kind of um, help you uh, see that. Um, so let me start with the old news. This has lots of features that we don't need for newbies as a revelation or anything like that. Um, the, uh, let's, let's start with things that are familiar. Let's hold the velocity, uh, the speed constant. And probably the easiest speed to hold a constant, fluid constant at is zero. Um, so let's have some water that's stationary, right? So here I have a body of water. And according to the equation, if I increase the height, what should happen to the pressure? Decreases. Decreases. Right? Something has to give for the quantity to be conserved. So what this is saying is that if you go higher above your reference point, usually the lowest height of interest, so h equals zero here, if I go higher in that fluid, the pressure should be lower. So the pressure should decrease on the way up. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, the lowest pressure is at the top. We, of course, have framed it the other way. Before, we measured depth from the surface downward. And of course, we know as we increase the depth, the pressure increases. So this is just the reverse. So definitely two things not to mix up with each other. D is depth. It's a positive distance below the surface, but that is not what is in Bernoulli's. In Bernoulli's, there's H, and it's good old PE, potential energy H. It's measured up from a reference. So if you go higher above the ground, you'll go shallower in a body of water, unless you can show me an upside down lake where you can go higher above the ground and also go deeper into it. I'd like to see that lake. It doesn't exist, though. Okay. So this is a familiar result, hopefully. This is just a statement of hydrostatic pressure. Pressure gets higher when you go deeper in a body of water. It goes, uh, pressure is lower when you go shallower. So that's old news. We framed it before in terms of hydrostatic pressure. Let's take a look at another one. Um, this might be what you're talking about. Let's hold a pressure constant. So how do we hold the pressure constant? Well, here's one way. Let's just take a garden hose, point it vertically, and have water spray up into the air. 
Now let me point out that once it enters the air, it's atmospheric pressure all around. PATM is all around. That's not going to change. The atmosphere has direct access to push on every bit of that water. None of it is deep under the surface. It's all surrounded by the air. So according to the equation, when we go higher, what should happen to the speed? Decrease. Decrease. In fact, what's going to be the speed of the water at the top of the arc, or at the top of the trajectory? Zero. Zero, if we're firing it straight up. So this is old news. This is really old news, though, right? We knew this, so this is just the same reason why a baseball slows down when you throw it upward, right? It slows down because it puts energy in storage and it takes it out of kinetics. Same is true with water molecules. Water molecules are subject to the same physics. Okay? So we're taking the very thing that's new and interesting about Bernoulli's, the pressure, we're holding it constant, and then we're having the two very old, familiar forms of energy trade off with each other again. So that's all pretty much, you know, this is old news, hydrostatic pressure, this is really old news, this is just projectiles. So I'm going to focus in on the third thing, where I'm going to hold the height constant. And if I decrease the pressure, what happens to the speed? Increase. So the lower the pressure gets, the faster the speed gets. Now there's something that seems very counterintuitive about this, but I'm going to explain where your uh, intuition may be a little problematic. By the way, this is what I started off the day with. This is where I had a narrowing pipe, and I had the fluid sped up. This is the finger on the end of a garden hose example. And the reason why you can think of it as speeding up is because the pressure behind is larger than the pressure ahead, right? So that's why it can experience a net force in that direction. We talked about the fact that force acts from higher pressure to lower pressure, right? If you have two pressures in competition, the bigger one wins. So the force points towards the lower pressure region. The nice thing about Bernoulli's is that it actually takes this idea and couches it as a conservation. So basically, we know that force from a fluid, it points from higher pressure to lower pressure, right? So the nice thing about Bernoulli's as it couches it is that, is that when the pressure goes lower, the V goes higher, okay? It's just a way to flip that idea into a conservation, okay? So taking th things from the force method to the energy method have their advantages, right? Is that now we can say if P goes low, P goes high. So let me give you an example of this. In fact, let me give you several examples of this. First conceptual, and then we'll calculate. I have a fire hose. They usually have one of these nozzles, right? Same for the same reason as you put your finger on the end of a garden hose, right? You want fast water velocity, right? You can shoot it into the fourth story window and put out a fire, right? From the street, if you're a firefighter. Now, I'm saying that the it flies out very fast, so it's a very high speed. So a high speed. But you've probably never heard of these called low pressure hoses, right? They're called high pressure hoses. So what am I doing saying that faster speed is lower pressure, right? Well, here's what's going on. It is a high pressure hose, okay? How is it high pressure? So it can be traded to high velocity, right? You don't have them both simultaneously. You have high pressure, so you can trade it to high velocity and low pressure. So the pressure outside the hose is actually low. It's high inside, so it can be traded to high velocity outside. 
In fact, the pressure out here is just basically about atmospheric pressure. So the speed is not that high in the, in the hose itself. It's actually pretty low speed. When you have a chance to have a very high pressure pushing against atmospheric pressure, of course, the high pressure is going to win. And there's going to be a very large accelerating force pointing from inside the hose to outside, and that's what's going to accelerate the water. So it trades from high pressure to high velocity and just about atmospheric pressure. Now you might claim, if you're sitting in front of this thing, so you're telling me it's no longer high pressure, right? Well, keep in mind that when it hits you, it's going back to low speed, high pressure. So you're trading back again, right? So here, the pressure is going back down again, or sorry, the, the speed's going back down again, so you get the high pressure back. It's a trade, right? So it's high pressure in the hose, it's high pressure when it hits you, but it's not high pressure when it's high speed, right? And so if you could somehow run along with it, right, and not actually slow it down at all, you would actually get roughly <coughs> atmospheric pressure, okay? So you're trading one for the other. It's never simultaneously high pressure and high speed. It's one or the other, okay? Let me show you another interesting thing about this. Um, let's draw some air molecules around the water stream. So let me talk about those air molecules. That's a fluid too, right? So let me say that they're, uh, these are about atmospheric pressure, and the speed is about zero. Now, obviously that's ridiculous. Air molecules are flying around. But let me kind of take that as the baseline, okay? So they have some speed, but no excess speed beyond what they're required to do. Now, what happens when a water molecule brushes past it? That's going to make these guys increase their speed a little bit, right? So the water molecule, or the air molecules that are kind of right next to the water stream actually go a little faster. Now, if this increases a little bit, what does that do to the pressure? Decrease. Decrease. So you actually have a slight lowering of atmospheric pressure just around the thing. Think of it like this. When those air molecules are not coordinated in any way, they push outward and cause a larger pressure, right? So this is a uh, lower speed and a higher pressure they're going to push outward in all directions. But if you coordinate them, right, like this, they're not going to be pushing out as much, right, in all directions. So if you increase their speed in a coordinated direction, you're going to lower their pressure pushing out in all directions, right? You're kind of getting them all coordinated. So they all move in a certain direction, so they don't move out randomly in all directions, and therefore, the pressure is less. So what you actually have is, is more normal atmospheric pressure out here, but a slightly reduced air pressure <coughs> right near the stream. Do you guys use uh, suction in chemistry? You have like a, a faucet with like a nozzle that's like super narrow, right? When you try to turn the, the faucet, it's like sprays at you because it comes out so fast. So you have those faucets because you occasionally you hook up a piece of tubing to them with a little side port. You ever do that? No? Oh, well, that's what they have them there for. What you do is you hook up a tube, and then you have a little side port. So that way you have access to the lower pressure next to the water stream without actually disturbing it. What's going to happen to the air here if you have um, atmospheric pressure here and a slightly low pressure here? It's going to push in. I don't know. Maybe you guys have more fancy apparatus like this. But this is one way you can create suction. That's why those faucets all have those narrow nozzles is so that you can use them for suction. I guess you never do. Okay. okay. So, um, 
Let me show you another example of that. Question? No? So here's you taking a shower in the morning. Okay. So that's not a fire hose, but you can't have showers where the water comes up pretty fast. What they do is they take the air molecules in the shower and do the same thing. They take them so that they go a little faster, so they're not as high pressure. So same thing. Pressure's over here, outside, you still have regular little atmospheric pressure. What's the force on the shower curtain? Which way? Inward. Inward. Anyone have this problem? Okay. Have to wet the uh, shower curtain, stick it to the side of the tub. Right, if, you're, if you can, that's Bernoulli's. Okay, pressure for speed, okay? Um, another example, maybe you took a shower this morning and then got in the car and you were late to class and you were trying to pass some big old truck, right? Trucks travel slow, maybe you're trying to get around it. Trucks are big, unaerodynamic beasts. They pick up the air and move it very, very fast. Probably know that if you ever were a truck's ever driven by while you've been standing there, right? <laughs> Feel the breeze, right? Higher speed, lower pressure. They carry these low pressure regions around their sides. Here you have atmospheric pressure still on your other side. What's the direction of the force on your car? Like this. Everyone, anyone ever pass the truck at high speed and notice you kind of have to hold on the wheel pretty carefully so you don't get. Don't crash. No? Just me? Okay. Um, ever notice a motorcycle, uh, motorcyclist jacket puff up on the highway? Okay. Atmospheric pressure inside the jacket. Air moves it faster around the edges, pressure's lower, so atmospheric pressure can puff it up from inside. Um, let's do another one. You can do it for fun with a piece of paper. <coughs> I'll do it once here on the edge because it's easier and I'll, I know it won't appear on the camera. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to blow air across the top. Not into it because I don't want to stop the fluid. I want to have it go fast, fast speed, low pressure. Blow it across the top. Lift it up. Notice that? Yeah. I'm not blowing underneath it. Okay. I'm making the air move faster across the top. So it's lower pressure. Let me try it here for the, the camera. Okay, so blow air across the top, higher speed, lower pressure. It lifts it. Yes? Yes. Okay, faster speed, lower pressure. So atmospheric pressure from the bottom lifts it up. You can do that too for good use. You can do it with an airplane wing. Now obviously with an airplane wing, you can't just have air moving across the top. It needs to move across the bottom too. All you need to do is make sure that the, the air is moving different speeds. So here we, do, here we have an airplane wing. Air is going to uh, go like this. And the wing is going to split the air. One goes like this, one goes like this. Now, let's take a look at the air across the top. The air across the top, at this point, Newton's laws would want it to continue to go straight. Now that it's no longer being cleaved out of the way by the leading edge of the wing, it should go straight. But let's look at why that would be a bad situation, or, could not, or not bad, but um, wouldn't allow an airplane to function. We basically have a vacuum here, right? We have no air here. Basically, the air got split apart. That's not possible. As they say, nature abhors a vacuum. It does not like regions of lower pressure. So this would be a low pressure region where there's hardly any air that is not going to last, okay? So the air wants to push in there. Now this air, so if we look at this air, that's easy to push in there. It has access to that region, right? So it goes, pushes in there, like that. 
And so there's some pressure equalization. This pressure will increase a little bit, but then at the expense of this pressure, okay? So there's a little bit of equalization. There's only so much air to go around. The air in the bottom says, hey, I want to get there too. I want to get to that lower pressure region. But there's a wing in the way, okay? So if it's going to want to get in there, it's going to have to take the whole wing with it. So we get this thing called lift. I should mention that the force is actually going to be more diagonal like this, right? It wants to get from here to here. We break that force into two components. So that force gets two components, one of which is upward and one of which is backwards against the motion. We call that drag. So the airplane wing feels a force against this motion. It also feels a force upward. Basically, the pressure on the bottom of the wing lifts it. Okay? What we have is that there is less pressure over here, generally speaking, more pressure over here because the wing is in the way, and that's why there's lift. Right? Force acts from low, more pressure to a less pressure. So the only thing you have to do, you can't do it like the piece of paper I had, right? For the piece of paper, I just blew air across one side, but not the other. Airplane wing has to travel through the air. What you just have to do is make sure that the pressure difference forms in a different way. So we do this by shaping the wing in a particular way. Okay. So that's a little bit about how airplanes fly. Okay. Um, let me give you another example real quick. Let's say your house is sitting in a low pressure region. What kind of weather are you in for? Rain, storms, bad weather. If it's really low pressure, you've got a hurricane. Okay? Why is that? Well, the higher pressure regions that are around you are going to accelerate air into your region. Right? So it goes to low pressure and high speed. If that blows across your house fast enough, okay, so that's high, high speed, low pressure, and you have high pressure inside your house, what's going to happen to your roof? Just like that piece of paper. Your roof can literally get lifted off and be carried away. Just like that piece of paper I had, we blow air across the top, it lifts. Old common urban legend is that you can crack your windows and equalize the pressure. I'm sorry to report that does not work. <laughs> because if you wanted the pressure to be as low inside your house, you'd have to have that the air is moving as fast. So your, everything in your house would just be destroyed from within, right? Maybe your roof wouldn't blow off. Maybe that's a good trade-off. Okay? Um, you may remember um, uh, Hurricane Rita over the Gulf of Mexico um, a couple years back. It set simultaneously set the record for the fastest wind speed ever recorded and the lowest pressure ever recorded. So, high speed, low pressure. Okay. So, I'll show you another example. Sports. Curveball. Let's try a curveball. Here's a top view of a curveball. Any baseball fans, uh, what do you get to do to a curveball besides just throw it? Spin it. Spin it. Try it. Give it some omega. So, let's draw the air here, going around it. Now, if you spin it, then this edge of the baseball is moving very fast against the air. So what do you expect will happen if we let a little bit of friction into the, into the situation, just talking conceptually here? What do you think it's going to do to the air? Slow it down or speed it up? Slow it down. So we have a lower speed here. And what does that mean about the pressure? Higher pressure. By the way, these stitches of the baseball are really important for this. They create some ability to interact with the air. Now, 
That's not, of course, what the stitches were there for originally, but with the stitching there, people are going to take advantage of it, right? They, nowadays, they can manufacture a baseball without stitches. They can make it a whole piece. But it's really important that it not be too smooth or you can't throw these pitches very effectively. Over on the other side, the stitching is moving with the air, and it actually makes the air go faster. So it makes it go to a higher speed than it would otherwise with the, due to the pressure. Lower the pressure. Okay, so which way does this baseball curve? Right? We get a lateral force pointing from higher pressure to lower pressure. It's going to curve to the side like that. That's how it works. And all baseball pitches are basically variations of this. It's just which way you make it curve, with the exception of the knuckleball, which is notable for its lack of curve and its erratic movement. I'm not going to throw a baseball in here and hurt somebody, but I do have a beach ball, which I can safely throw. And I'm going to try to curve it. I'm going to try to throw a curveball. This is the top view. It's rotating like this. So let's see what that would be like this. Okay, so if I do it like this, it should curve this way. Let's see if I can get it. You got a nice upward curve there. I try it again. The curve. Oh, get another nice upward curve. I want to try one of those, I guess. You can see it kind of hangs there because it's curving upward. The uh, one of my finer moments ever in teaching. I was I was doing this demo in a very large lecture class. It was nice because it had big, nice ceilings. You could really kind of give it some. Serious oomph. There was a kid sleeping in the back row. <laughs> I wasn't aiming for him, I swear, but it just woke him up. I, I couldn't have aimed it better. Um, uh, so there's a bit about a curveball. Works off the same principle. You can see that this just appears in so many different ways. Okay? So this idea of trading speed for pressure. So when you hear high pressure, think, oh, high pressure can be traded for high speed. Not that high pressure equals high speed, but if you have high pressure, you can use it to, tr to convert it to high speed. Um, so it looks like today I didn't quite get a chance um, to uh, set up the calculational example, but I think we still have plenty of time. Um, that homework is not due until next week. So uh, beginning of next lecture, I'll do a calculation example. And then we'll move on to uh, waves.